Hello, I'm Mr. Eliason, and welcome to World History. Today we're going to talk about the effects of the aftermath of World War I on a variety of different Asian societies, sort of going from South Asia all the way through West Asia to look at the development of Asian nationalism as a result of some of the movements associated with World War I. So here's our objectives for today. Take a moment and take them in, and then we'll move forward. Part of South Asian nationalism came because of Indian participation in World War I. There was a real sense that if the Indian people rose up and fought for Great Britain in World War I, that after, in the aftermath, Great Britain would give them more rights, more self-government, great, a greater position within the empire. And what they found was, for the most part, this did not happen. In general, despite the sacrifice of Indian soldiers, the British still considered them more or less second-class citizens. England, because of sort of the economic turmoil of the war, felt even more pressure to keep control over their colonies, especially, of course, India, the crown jewel of the British Empire. And so there was a significant resistance in England to pushing much, much reform, much to the chagrin and disappointment of many of the Indian peoples. This gave strength to what's called the New in Indian Movement or the New Nationalist Movement. So take a moment, pause, and read this. Obviously, this is happening before World War I, but after the British did not give the Indians the rights they were hoping for, unsurprisingly, significantly more, a larger percentage of the Indian population decided to embrace ideas like this. In response to this and other reform movements, England cracked down on dissent, passing the Rowland Acts, which allowed them to jail political protesters indefinitely, have them uh, put them in jail for long periods without trial, and basically try to stifle political speech and any type of independence movement. Indians responded to this in general through nonviolent resistance, you know, breaking these laws and uh, attempting to hold marches protesting these new British practices. So if England was going to make political speech illegal, lots of Indian people were going to rise up and speak out politically and more or less dare the government to arrest them. So here's uh, the principles of Indian non-resistance as part of this group, the Indian National Congress, which is going to be very important moving forward. So pause, read, let's keep moving. The English responded with violence and oppression. Most famously, the Amritsar massacre, British troops opened fire on uh, peaceful protesters, killing a significant number of them. And this, again, was a massive humiliation for England because theoretically they were fighting the war to keep the world safe for democracy and to get rid of German barbarism. And then here they were treating their subject peoples in India like second class citizens and turning guns on peaceful protesters. Leaders like Ali Jinnah capitalized on this to form the Muslim League, and he became one of the key Muslim leaders pushing for Indian nationalism and independence. And the most important leader to come out of this is Mohandas Gandhi, who became a leader in the Indian National Congress, pushing again for Indian independence for Great Britain, economic improvements, and uh, more, you know, more rights and recognition. Gandhi is going to push a strategy called civil disobedience in conjunction with his nonviolent resistance. So not only are the Indians not going to be armed, but they're going to intentionally violate British laws in order to demonstrate, you know, how, you know, how one, how unfair the laws are, and two, basically daring the British to try to fill up the jails with them. Because if enough Indians stop following British law, then, you know, the British, they can't put all of them in jail. Or if they keep using, you know, brutal reprisals like the Amritsar massacre, world or global public opinion is going to turn against the British and it's going to lead to more sympathy for Indian independence. By economically hitting the British, Gandhi also hoped to convince the British to provide India with more rights and more uh, self-government through economic strikes and boycotts. Gandhi famously made his own clothing in order to protest, you know, British sort of text, the British uh, in building up the Indian cotton industry, and then, of course, the British textile industry. And so in order to, and of course, to encourage the India, the development of a textile industry in India, which the British have been brutally suppressing for, you know, pretty much the entire time the East India Company had been there. And so by economically trying to harm Great Britain, Gandhi hoped to put pressure the British to pass many needed reforms. Gandhi's probably his most famous uh, act of protest was the Salt March. 
Uh, the British had a monopoly on salt production and used the salt tax as one of the main ways to raise revenue in India. And so Gandhi led a whole group of Indians on a nonviolent uh, march down to the Arabian Sea, where they were going to then gather sea salt in protest of British law. The British attacked peace, these peaceful marchers, uh, jailed Gandhi before the march could even happen. And in the end, their massive reprisals of this led to a global pushback. And eventually, in the 1930s, England did pass the Government of India Act, which allowed constitutional government from, for Indians, allowed more Indians to take positions within Indian government, and gave significantly more self-rule to South Asian people, although importantly, not independence. And so this is going to be very important moving forward because it is some of the steps that Indian reformers wanted to be done, but it was not, you know, it does not cover the entire story, and it does not give them independence. The Ottoman Empire, as you hopefully remember, joined in World War I on the side of the Central Powers in order to try to gain back territory that they'd lost in the Balkans, gain back authority over Egypt, potentially gain back some territory from Russia and the Caucasus, and in the end, the Ottoman Empire lost the war and was defeated. The Ottoman Empire then collapsed and its various subject peoples declared independence, creating their own countries. Father of modern Turkey is Ataturk, Mustafa Kemal. You may remember him as one of the commander, Ottoman commanders who was ordering his troops to die in the Battle of Gallipoli. But he's going to lead to he's going to lead the push for the creation of an independent Turkey. And he's going to create this new country sort of separate from the European spheres of influence that had been created before. And so this is the territory of the sykes pico Agreement that you see here on the map, the secret agreement between the British and the French and the Russians to divide up the Middle East. And Mustafa Kemal is going to argue strongly against any territory in this country called Turkey that he's going to uh, that of be, uh, being under economically under any European sort of economic influence. The principles that Mustafa Kemal pushes in independent Turkey are known as the six arrows: republicanism, popularism, secularism, reformism, nationalism, and statism. You don't need to know all of these in general. What you do need to know is that modern Turkey becomes a secular democracy. So whereas the Ottoman Empire had a sultan who was also the caliph, the head of sort of Sunni Islam throughout the world, Turkey is going to be a predominantly secular society ruled by sort of a parliament and an elected prime minister with elections for the people from the people sort of in an enlightenment style. And so this leads to the creation of this secular modern Turkey that is no longer sort of the head of the Muslim world. One of the subject peoples, the Arab peoples, are going to form their own homeland, Saudi Arabia. Uh, this was founded by, you know, in the aftermath of the Arab Revolt with the creation of the with the creation of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And it's called Saudi Arabia because the Saud dynasty is going to control it. Uh, it's still a monarchy controlled by the Saud family. And why well, Saudi Arabia is going to become incredibly powerful because of the discovery of substantial oil resources along the Persian Gulf that makes Saudi Arabia incredibly wealthy, despite the fact that the vast majority of it is desert. So keep that in mind. Saudi Arabia is going to become important later, so we just need to briefly touch on its founding here. The sykes pico Agreement divides up most of the rest of uh, South Asia. Obviously, the Italians aren't going to get anything out of this, you know, and that'll be one of the things that makes them very upset going forward. Ataturk demands that uh, no, no part of Turkey is given up to the Ottomans. The Russians don't get anything because Russia doesn't exist anymore for reasons that we'll talk about in two lessons. Syria is created mostly under French control. Iraq is created under British control. Jordan is created under British control. The country of Kuwait is carved off in order to ensure oil reserves are kept out of the hands of uh, the new Iraq government, which again is going to be controversial later. And Europeans are going to embrace mostly economic imperialism in these places, you know, setting up, you know, client kings who are more or less sympathetic to European interests and controlling the fates of these Middle Eastern countries through sort of economic means as opposed to sort of pri the prior system of direct or indirect rule. The creation of Palestine is going to be especially controversial because this contains, of course, all the holy lands that are important to both Christian, Jewish people, and Muslims. Uh, Palestine is home to a group called the Palestinians, an ethnic group who wanted their own homeland as well. 
when the British marched into sort of Jerusalem and took over the Holy Land, uh, they promised the Palestinians that they would create a state for them to have self-government. So they carved this country of Palestine out of Transjordan. But at the same time, the British were also promising that they would help create a homeland for the Jewish people. Because, of course, Israel is very important and the city of of Jerusalem is very important for Jewish people as the home of the temple and sort of the promised land that was, you know, given to the Jewish people by God in the Old Testament. And so the Jewish people are going to push to create this Jewish homeland. Uh, This Zionist movement is going to gain power. And specifically the Balfour Declaration, the British government's support for this is incredibly important because anti Anti-Semitism is going to be growing throughout Europe. The Dreyfus Affair in France, sort of after the Franco-Prussian War, represents how Jewish people are often scapegoated. The Germans are at this point, to some degree, also scapegoating Jewish people, you know, very concerned that maybe they're um, they're stabbing them in the back, quote unquote, is what lost the war. And so this push to create a Jewish homeland in Israel is going to be a movement that is going to gain steam throughout the 1920s. And we're going to see even before the end of World War, even before World War II, significant Jewish populations moving to this region and beginning to settle. And so this is going to become very important moving forward. So that brings us to the end of the lesson for today. Uh, Nationalism is going to create new states in South Asia, but also going to create more conflicts. And conflict is really going to expand when the global financial system collapses after the great stock market collapse of 1929. But that's a story for next time. So we'll leave you right here for now. Thank you for listening.